Tedakota Tefano o Auckland Unitarians. Tedakota nam anuhiri. No mai, higher mai, higher mai ki tene fare karakia ate atoa tedakota tek tedakota tene tato katoa. We welcome you into this circle of community. If you're a first time visitor, you might wonder why Auckland Unitarians have come to this sacred space for 116 years and three weeks. <laughs> we are people of all ages who enter this space bringing our joys and our concerns. We come together in hope. We greet each other warmly with our voices and our smiles, we come together in peace. We light the chalice to symbolize our interdependence and unity. We come together in harmony. We share our growth and aspirations. We come together in wonder. We share our losses and our disappointments. We come together in sorrow. We share our concern and our compassion, and we come together in love. We come to this place bringing our doubts and our faith. We come together as seekers. We come to this place to welcome you at morning tea. We come to offer you the sacrament of hospitality. Please join us. It won't be complete without you. Now let us move into worship, willing to be authentic with others, each other, honest with ourselves, and open to connection in all its forms. Hope is our theme today. And one of my favorite poems about hope is Still I Rise by Maya Angelou. ever there were a time for a candle in the darkness, this would be it, using a spark of hope. Kindle the flame of love, ignite the light of peace, and feed the flame of justice. Sometimes a sermon topic comes along like an interruption while I'm going blithely about my life. This one came during my most recent session with my supervisor, who I check in with every couple of months to reflect on my spiritual and emotional health. The question of hope came up after her asking my view of having an afterlife. I answered, I wasn't expecting one. She was intrigued that a minister didn't believe in life after death. I told her it was worse than that. I didn't believe in a personal God either. At that point, she asked, where do I find hope? The question lingered with me. And the next 20 minutes are my attempt to answer it. When looking for something in my experience, it is good to know what it is you're looking for. The problem is, where hope is concerned, I find it hard to describe, or even where I left it last. It's not like looking for your car keys. Sure, we have lots of Unitarian songs that mention it. People speak of hoping all the time, like they found it, or at least know where it is. But what does it look like? How does it feel? How important is it that I find it? These questions will not be satisfied by a dictionary definition. If that were true, I could cut this sermon down by 18 minutes and just tell you hope is a feeling of expectation and desire for a particular thing to happen. Unfortunately for you, 
I don't find a pie in the sky or a wishful thinking definition worth looking for. I'm going to need the full 20 minutes. After all, Paul in his first letter to the Corinthians linked hope with the mysteries of faith and love. And for that, I'm willing to spend some time looking. So where did we lose it? Unitarian theologian, the Reverend Dr. Parker, suggests that we are living in a post-apocalyptic world. We're living in the aftermath of devastation. The world is filled with remnants, surviving fallen towers, tsunamis, hurricanes, floods, famine, disease, and war. In her book, What Can Save Us Now?, Parker writes, We are living in a post-slavery, post-Holocaust, post-Vietnam, post-Hiroshima world. We're living in the aftermath of collective violence that has been severe, massive, and traumatic. The scars from slavery, genocide, and meaningless war mark our bodies. We're living in the midst of a rainforest burning, the rapid death of species, the growing pollution of the air and water and new mutations of racism and violence. I'd say it hasn't gotten much better since she wrote that in 2006. In the same year, a haunting film was released that captures the feelings behind her words. Children of Men. The year is 2027. The place is Southern England the world is a different place. For some reason that that scientists cannot determine, humankind around the world have become infertile. The last child born on the planet 18 years earlier has just died. Humankind has less than a generation away from extinction. Society is on the brink of collapse. Economies and governments all around the world have ceased to function. Refugees have flooded the United Kingdom, which is now a police state that is rounding up immigrants and incarcerating them in concentration camps. A suicide drug is distributed to citizens who can no longer live in a world that has no future or meaning. And then a militant immigrants' rights group the fishes, discover that a young West African refugee named Key is pregnant. The fishes kidnap Theo, a disillusioned former activist who is now a government bureaucrat, and force him to help them smuggle Key to the coast where they say they will deliver her and the child she is carrying to a mysterious group called the Human Project which is supposedly based in the Azores and dedicated to curing infertility. There's a lot more to the movie, but to make a long story short, the film ends with Key, her newborn baby, and Theo huddled together in a small rowboat in the English Channel in the dark of night, waiting for the Human Project's ship, which bears the name Tomorrow. It appears through the fog, only seconds after Theo dies from the wounds he sustained in saving Key and her child from both the militants and the British Army. The film's dark premise and uncertain end raises the question of what meaning, if any, hope could possibly have in the face of overwhelming hopelessness, futility, and despair. Is it possible to live with hope in the face of a future that is almost certainly no future? Is it possible to live without hope? These questions are real, not hypothetical, and personal, not abstract. Where can we find hope for the earth and future generations when our factories and automobiles have put so much carbon dioxide in the atmosphere that we may have already passed the point of no return with respect 
to devastating climate change. Where was hope at Auschwitz? Where is hope for Rachel's colleague whose son committed suicide this week? Where is hope for our deported Indian students still seeking permission to return to complete their interrupted education? Where is hope for those sleeping rough on our streets? Where is hope when we receive a terminal diagnosis, lose a mate, are made redundant, too young to retire and too old to begin a new career? So what can I say about hope when hope is hard to find? What can I say about hope that does not ignore the reality of hopelessness, suffering, uncertainty, and despair? A hope that is more than just wishful thinking or irrational optimism. Vaclav Havel, you may remember the name, he's a playwright, or was a playwright, and the first president of the Czech Republic. He tells a story that reveals finding hope in the absurdity of life. In 1989, only a few months before I was to become, to my bewilderment, an actual head of state, I survived my own death. I had arrived in the countryside, outside Prague, to visit artist friends. After a feast by a bonfire, I led a friend who had had too much to drink down a dark path toward a house nearby. In the total darkness, though completely sober, I suddenly fell into a black hole surrounded by a cement wall. In fact, the fact is, I had fallen into a sewer, into what can only be called, you'll excuse me, shit. I've always wanted to say that from the pulpit. <laughs> My attempt to swim in this fundamental mud, this strange vegetation, was in vain. I began to sink deeper into the ooze. Meanwhile, a tremendous panic broke out above me. Local citizens flashed lights, grasped one another's arms, legs, offering limbs, articles of clothing to grab. A chaos of impossible rescue techniques followed. This brave fight for my life went on for at least 30 minutes. I could barely keep my nose above the dreadful effluvium and thought this was the end. What a way to go. When someone had the fine idea of putting down a long ladder. Who could have known I was to leave this unfortunate sewer only to end up in the president's office two months later? I was not, after all, to have the distinction of becoming the first playwright to drown in shit. <laughs> From this experience, he had these observations about where to find hope. What was striking about the Sur experience was how hope had emerged from hopelessness, from absurdity. I've always been deeply affected by the theater of the absurd because I believe it shows the world as it is in a state of crisis. It shows man having lost his fundamental metaphysical certainty, his relationship to the spiritual, the sensation of meaning. In other words, having lost the ground under his feet. This is a man for whom everything is coming apart, whose world is collapsing, who senses he has irrevocably lost something, but is unable to admit this to himself, and therefore hides from it. The kind of hope I often think about, especially in hopeless situations like prison or the sewer, is, I believe, a state of mind. I believe a state of mind, not a state of the world. I'm not sure I said that right. The kind of hope I often think about, especially in hopeless situations like prison or the sewer, is, 
I believe, a state of mind, not a state of the world. Either we have hope within us or we don't. Hope is not a prognostication. It's an orientation of the spirit. Each of us must find real fundamental hope within himself. You can't delegate that to anyone else. Hope in this deep and powerful sense is not the same as joy when things are going well or willingness to invest in enterprises that are obviously headed for success but rather an ability to work for something to succeed. Hope is definitely not the same thing as optimism. It is not the conviction that something will turn out well, but the certainty that something makes sense, regardless of how it turns out. It is this hope, above all, that gives us strength to live and to continually try new things even in conditions that seem as hopeless as ours do, here and now. In the face of this absurdity, life is too precious a thing to permit its devaluation by living pointlessly, emptily, without meaning, without love, and finally, without hope. What I take from Havel is is that hope is part of who we are and what it means to be human. Hardwired by genetics or evolution as part of the human spirit. Hope is a natural human capacity, like the capacity to love. It lives as much in the heart as in the mind or the will. And yet, hope is also a choice, an existential choice that goes to the heart of who we are as individual human beings and how we choose to live. Whether we will live in hope or without hope, whether and how we will orient our spirits and hearts toward possibility, meaning, connection, and joy in the face of chaos, uncertainty, suffering, and despair. So, so, when hope is hard to find, the first place to look is within ourselves. What it looks like is not the probable, but the possible. It acts as if the possible is, in fact, possible. And in doing so, may make the possible more possible. Because I believe that the future is genuinely and radically open. That the universe is continually evolving. That life is continually unfolding. Nothing is absolutely certain or fixed or finally determined. All things are possible. Anything is possible. There is more than enough room for hope. There is a corollary to finding the hope within. We are unlikely to see what is right before our eyes unless we look for it within community. Linda Hampton, a minister and professor of philosophy, has noted, in a world of greater and greater mistrust, people are desperate for the hope found in community. The hope that it is possible not just to tolerate, but to benefit from, to live fuller lives because of the company of strangers. It may be the greatest contribution our religious communities can make to the larger world. Not just our social justice projects, important as those are, but our modeling for the larger world an alternative reality to the mistrust, inequality, and narrow self-interest 
that is rampant there. The way to change the world, contemporary Unitarian activist Betty Ride Soskin, Reed Soskin tells us, is to be what we want to see. Hope is easier for others to find if we're being hope. What Unitarians have to offer a world fearful of vulnerability and death is the possibility of genuine hope. Hope in the world we have, hope in the finite interdependent creatures we are, hope in the relationship of love and friendship, hope in the communities we create, not only with one another, but with the strangers with whom we are lucky enough to be in company. Some luck lies in not getting what you thought you wanted, writes Garrison Keeler in Look Woebegone Days. But getting what you have, which once you have it, you may be smart enough to see is what you would have wanted had you known. I'll repeat that. It's such a good quote. Some luck lies in not getting what you wanted, you thought you wanted. But getting what you have, which once you have it, you may be smart enough to see is what you would have wanted had you known. I confess it's taken me most of my life to become smart enough to know how lucky I am to be a human being. Now I'm beginning to know how lucky I am to be risking community with friends and with strangers who offer me a song of love and a rose in the wintertime. comfortable for a moment and I want to share this meditation by Samuel Trumbore close your eyes so you can kind of take it in I invite you now into a time of gratitude reflection renewal and hope what an unearned blessing to delight in the calming peace of this space. To hear the Tui song again at daybreak. To feel the warmth in this room. And to enjoy the promise of a summer almost upon us. Each moment of wakefulness has so many gifts that offer energy and delight. Yet too often, they seem unavailable as the weight of our troubles press down on us. The threats to our well-being, real or exaggerated, feel like mosquitoes in the night looking for a place to land. Minds become captive to rising floodwaters, forceful, murky, threatening, and ominous. Even in moments of great danger, the direction of attention is a choice. Fear can dominate the mind, binding it like a straitjacket. Or love can unbind it and open it to resource and opportunity. The soil, the soil of the mind can be watered with kindness. The thorns can be removed one by one to appreciate the buds ready to flower. Great possibilities await us, even if we can see, if all we can see is the cliff before us. The grandeur of life, of which we are a part, scatters rainbows in every direction, even as the del deluge approaches. Holding reality and possibility together is the holy, hope-filled work of humanity if we choose it again and again in love.
closing words. May our faith sustain us, our hope inspire us, and our love surround us as we separate, as we go, as we go our separate ways, knowing that we will gather again in this beloved community. Amen. Thank you.